Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second edition of Secrets of the Ring with Raven. Thank you very much for joining us today. And um, the first edition, of course, focused on working as a baby face. It did? Yes, it did. Oh, wow, damn, and I remember. <laughs> today, we will talk about working as a heel. Oh, is this the second one? Yep, this is number no, this two. Is, this is not going to be about working as a heel. Today is going to be about star power. The heel one will have to wait because the star power thing's on my mind. I brought some visual aids here. All right. Star power. Very important to have star power. No masquerist. I will probably for most of your time. Look at this outfit. No masquerist actually stands for the man of a thousand masks, is it? Something like that. A million masks, hundred masks, a lot of masks. Give me a shot of that, camera dude. All right, that's enough of that. All right, Ric Flair. The robes, all the cool stuff. Look in the back. Some pictures of the Heartbreak Kid, Ultimate Warrior. Cool outfits. All right. Jushin Thunder Liger. These just happen to be the dolls handy. That's why I got a, I got a Mexican, a Japanese, and an American. All right, anyway, the whole point is this. It doesn't matter how good you are in a ring, unless you're someone of a skill level of like a Benoit or somebody, ultimately, without star power, the odds of you making it anywhere are so slim to none, it's practically astronomical. And I mean, I think the whole idea of anybody getting in this business is they want to get to the top of the heap, use a cliche, which I hate cliches, but you want to get to, you know, become, everybody wants to be world champion. I mean, at least, I don't know why you would get in this business unless you want to be world champion. I mean, maybe you're a realist and you realize, like, I don't have the skills, I don't have the size. You know, when I got in, I was 220 pounds. Uh, I was 5'10 and 3 quarters then. That's so small at the time. Now right, well, yeah, I was going to say, then I was extremely small. Like, like now there's guys 150 pounds, but when I started, 220 was small. I mean, 220 was a cruiserweight. I mean, now a cruise, 220 is actually a pretty good-sized guy. A cruiserweight now is anybody under 180. AJ Styles is 185. When I started, 220 was tiny. And uh, actually, that's probably about 218. I was only, and now I'm like 6'1". I've actually grown since then somehow. I don't know why. But um, probably all the chiropractic. Practic. But uh, I'm six foot to six one now. I'm two forty seven. A um, little too much in the midsection, um, which you can kind of get away with the longer you're in the business. But I don't, uh, you know, I don't recommend it, and I don't recommend it for myself. But uh, my legs been bothering me, so I can't do cardio. That's a good excuse. I always use that. My legs been bothering me, so I can't do cardio. But anyway, my point being is this: when I started, two twenty was tiny. Um, WWF at the time, everybody was 285 and just gassed to the gills. Um, and I never had a problem with doing with doing gas. I mean, even on the gas, I could only get to 220. When I graduated high school, I was 160 after two years of lifting. Which, if you think about it, AJ Styles graduated high school at 185. So AJ Styles was tw the way the size he is now was 25 pounds bigger than me when I started. So it took a lot of training just to get to at that time a really passable size. Um, and 220, I mean, I was a cruiserweight. I mean, we had, WWE wouldn't even think of hiring me. WCW put me in the cruiserweight division with Brian Pillman, um, who was probably the only guy, you know, my size or less. So, I mean, so being a realist, you have to be a realist, but I mean, everybody wants to be world champion. But I mean, you have to be a realist thinking, well, I might have a shot, I might not. Um, the whole point, though, is without star power, it really doesn't matter. What's that noise? Uh, whatever, doesn't bother me. Anyway, without star power, that's some guy with the weed whacker outside. Anyway, without star power, your odds of making it decrease astronomically. Because, all right, think about this. I, I talk to all these cruiserweights all the time, all these small guys, and, and I have nothing against smaller wrestlers. In fact, I, I like a lot of them. I think a lot of them got a lot of potential, like Daniels and AJ Styles. I think AJ's phenomenal. I mean, I think he lives up to his name. Um, Oh, and just for the, just so to put this in perspective, Shawn Michaels was six one, probably two twenty. Everybody thinks he's a lot smaller than he is, but he isn't. And that was back in the day when I, so he was stuck in a tag team. You know, he was in the AWA when I broke in, and then uh, went to New York. He was he was stuck in a tag team because he was too small. And finally, finally, when the big steroid scandal hit in '92, and Brett was given the belt, then Sean was given an opportunity. But so prior to '92, '93, '94, '95, I'm sure I wouldn't. Yeah, '92, '93, '94, '95. You got to be a certain size. So, which is all part of the star power package. You have to look the part. You have to fit the part. I mean, all right. I talk to all the cruiserweights, and they're all like, and all they do is work on their moves, work on their moves, work on their moves. And I'm like, you can do all the moves in the world. It doesn't mean you're going to get over. I mean, the people, you know, it's, it's like watching a movie where all there is is a bunch of car crashes, wrecks, blah, 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 blah. 
bit, it's entertaining, but when it's over, you can't really remember much about it because there was no plot, there was no story, there was nothing to hook your interest. The best stories are always when you have good storytelling and good characters. And without star power, you have no characters. I mean, if when you watch TV, if a character isn't interesting, are you going to keep watching the show? No. I mean, maybe, maybe if the storyline is that fantastic, but if the characters aren't they don't jump off the screen if they're not larger than life. I mean, there's a reason why Clint Eastwood, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone make piles and piles of money because people come to see their movies. They'll come see them in a bad movie, you know, because they have star power. You want to see them. Russell Crowe, star power. Orlando Bloom, no star power. Now, there's a great example. Russell Crowe in Gladiator was believable on the part. He was, um, he carried himself like a star. He made you believe that he was Maximus the General. Orlando Bloom in Kingdom of Heaven, which I haven't seen, I wanted to, I haven't got around to yet. I just have a hard time believing him as a kick-ass leader because he looks too boyish. He doesn't look like a tough guy. He doesn't carry himself like a tough guy. He doesn't have that star power to make me believe that he could do what, he, what you need him to do. And the box office receipts pretty much show that you know my, my review is accurate. You know, I still want to see it and, and go for myself, but my point I'm trying to make here is you have to be a star to get people interested. You have to carry yourself. I mean, Roddy Piper was such a star. He carried himself in such a way and had such a distinctive promo and personality. Hulk Hogan, Junkyard Dog. There was a reason why Vince in 84, when he took over the business, was able to take over because he pretty much went to every territory and picked the biggest star out of each or anybody with the most star power and, and, they, and, and used them to be his launching pad. But without star power... I mean, how do you do it? You know, and that's the reason why WCW for years was in second place because they didn't have the star power to match Vince. And then when Bischoff started buying the, the top stars, hey, he turned it around instantly. You know, then bad storytelling and the fact that he didn't elevate people when he needed to turned the business around, but that's an entirely different matter. Bischoff should still be credited with literally turning, single-handedly almost, turning the business around because the business was so far on its ass that it makes now look like one of the most prosperous periods ever. I mean, right now, Raw's doing like a 3-4 maybe, something like that? 3-5. 3-5. Yeah. I remember when I, was, when I was back in the WWF the first time as Johnny Polo. And that was 91, Gabe, 92? Something like that. Something like that. And I had the fifth highest rated Raw of all time. Me against uh, X-Pac, and he didn't, he, somehow he didn't make the match. I think he was hurt. So it was me and Marty Jannetty, but the rating was like a 3-2. It was the fifth highest rated Raw of all time. So the numbers, so you, you got to see, so no matter how bad you think the business is now, it was so bad back then, unbelievable. And, this, and before Raw, it was even worse. So... What happened was there was no stars in the business. All the stars had either gotten old, retired, or just were on their last legs, and there were no new stars to replace them. And, and so today's up-and-comers, there's no new stars to replace them, and that's why the business, is, that's part of the reason why the business is on his ass. Two reasons. Bad storytelling and no stars. No characters to, to, to inhabit the storylines. The reason why ECW was so influential in the first place was because that very... The characters were all iconic, star, you know, Steve is the Sandman, um, Shane Douglas, the, the consummate wrestler at the time, um, Sandman, Sabu, the homicidal, genocidal, suicidal maniac, the public enemy, these white, bla these white black guys, wiggers, rappers, um, Mikey Ripwreck, this kid who was so terrified to get in the ring, but Cactus made him do it, I'll do it, bang, bang. Um, Cactus Jack, there were so many interesting, unique characters. Later on ECW, when they actually became more fiscally solvent, which means uh, financially uh, doing better, um, for those at home who are stupid, um, the, um, even though they did better monetarily and drew bigger houses, well, I don't know if they did better monetarily, but they drew bigger houses, they were no longer influential and Paulie couldn't make it run anymore because he didn't have the characters to build, to build around. Nothing, it's not that he didn't have the talent. He didn't have the characters. Talent and characters are two different things. You know, you can say all you want about Hacksaw Jim Duggan that he wasn't a good worker. Bullshit. The guy put asses in seats, and you can check his track record in Mid-South UWF. He put a lot of asses in seats, and I would much rather have a guy who puts asses in seats than a guy who can do a bunch of crazy moves. Just because someone is, um, is critically 
quickly by the sheets of the internet, oh, this guy's phenomenal. It doesn't mean anything because they're not taking into account whether people, like, I, I'll give you the best example. When I was in ECW, Benoit and, and Guerrero, actually, I'm sorry, it was Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko, who everybody raves as two great phenomenal workers, blah, blah, blah. I remember being at matches where the, the crowd booed him out of the building to the point where Dean Malenko would grab the mic and tell the people to shut the fuck up because, you know, it's fucking insulting. They're busting their ass, and he was right, but still, the crowd didn't care. So... Doesn't matter how good technically you are, if you if people don't care about it, it doesn't make a fucking difference. And that's something the internet and the sheets don't get. And all these guys that keep getting put over, this guy's so good, this guy's so great, push him, push him. Well, you can't push him if they don't have the skills to carry it. You know, I love Jeff Hardy to death, and for years, push him, push him, push him. Except the point was, and all the sheets kept saying, and then he got the TNA and they push him. He goes, well, he doesn't care anymore. Well, I don't think it had anything to do with that. The, the guy can't cut promos. Nothing against him personally. I love. Jeff, but it, he's not a promo man, Matt was, and without promos, how are you going to talk people into the seats? You know, you can only, there's going to be a few exceptions like Goldberg, of course, but for the most part, if you can't talk him into the seats, you have to be a character, you have to have star power, which includes microphone skills as well. Um, star power. Junkyard Dog, wasn't, a, wasn't much of a worker at all. He made Watts so much fucking money, I mean, it, it was scary how much money he made for Watts. You know, you could say, well, he couldn't work. Well, who gives a shit? Hulk Hogan. Hey, Flair was a thousand times better working than Hulk Hogan. But it doesn't matter. Hulk Hogan put more asses in seats. You know, now when you have a guy like Austin who can do both, that's fucking, that's the best of both worlds. Or like The Rock. But that's few and far between. And, and, and not to say that Flair didn't have star power, because he did. Flair was one of the most charismatic, star-powered individuals ever. It's just Hogan was even bigger than he was. It's bigger than life, physically. Um, you know, Hogan was like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, but he came across like he was 6'10", like he was the baddest man on the planet. Um, Taz. All he convinced the world that Taz was the single baddest man on the planet. I mean, if you put Taz in a shoot fight, he would have got annihilated. But it doesn't matter, because Paulie created this character who was larger than life, and people believed it. For the most part, there are a few components to star power, and uh, some people don't need all the components. Some people are so good at one, they don't need any of the others. And then, so there's all almost of variables. And not to say Jeff Hardy doesn't have star power, because he does. But star power without, if you're missing certain aspects of it, then it only goes so far as well. So there's, there's a whole lot of variables, and to try and pin it down, which I will try, is a little more complicated than it seems, but th the point I'm trying to make is this, is you can be the greatest ring technician ever, but if you can't put asses in seats, it doesn't matter, and the way you put asses in seats is you become a star. Um, and back to my point that I keep jumping over myself, I talked to all these cruiserweights, and I'm like, who, was, who, who did you want to be when you got into wrestling? I wanted to be Shawn Michaels. 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 And all they do is they try and do all the moves he did. But that's not all Shawn was. Shawn could talk. Shawn had style. He had grace. He knew when to sell, when not to sell. And more than anything, he came across like a star. If you believe that he was one of the biggest stars on the planet, he carried himself like a star. You know, his ring outfits, you know, these great ring costumes. He had so much to the package that, that frankly, if all you saw was his ring work, then I don't know what the fuck you were looking at. And so when you want to emulate him, why are you just taking the ring work? And when you go to the ring and practice, like, you know, I'll talk to guys like Elix Skipper, I love Elix. And for the longest time, all he would do is work on new moves, work on new moves. I'm like, Elix, what's your character? I don't know. What would he say in a promo? I don't know. I go, well, Elix, he goes, well, it's prime time. I go, what does that mean? I don't know. I go, well, I go, that's my whole point. I go, and, and, I, and I, Elix is a very good, I love Elix, a very good guy. But what I tried to explain to him, and now we see is starting to get is that you can learn all the moves but if you don't have the rest of the package the moves are inconsequential so I said instead of working on the moves anymore why don't you spend all the t all the time that you lay in bed at night thinking of moves and all the time during the day when you're driving around going oh this would be a cool move spend it working on your character you know and that's what most of these cruiserweights don't do because they're like ah they just want to be the, a worker but a worker in the old days was just a good hand he was a guy underneath to put over the stars I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the guy who puts over the stars. I want to be the star, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's a simple equation. Be a star or be the guy that makes the star. I don't know. I think being a star pays a lot more, and it's a lot more prestigious, and it's a lot more fun. Um, one of the things I always say is, one of the most basic things you can do is get a ring jacket. 
which actually, if you talk to any old ECW, it actually gets a laugh because I'm so strident about it that it actually became like a goofy locker room backstage catchphrase to, to mock me. But and good, and like, but to mock me and fun because they understand it's an accurate point. But I was so argumentative about the point that it became preposterous. Um, but if you just come to the ring in a pair of tights, I mean, how blasé and bland is that? You know, there are the exceptions to the rule. Like I'll give you for an example, Taz. But when Paulie made him, he didn't need it, but that also fit his character because his character was like a Mike Tyson type, bare bones minimalist. Same with Austin. He also there, had the towel over his head. Yeah, the towel over his head, which actually added a whole lot, which was a very interesting thing that he added to it. Austin, he didn't. He just had the vest, but he didn't need much either because once again, there are always exceptions to the rules. But the Warrior, as fucking rotten as he was in the ring he drew money he put asses in seats and he made a shitload of money I mean enough money that he never had to work again you know he was a chiropractor I don't think he's ever cracked the back since you know he was starving to death in Texas as a dingo warrior went to New York and made millions I mean and that was back when when uh he made a million. He was making a million a year when the only person who ever made a million a year was Hogan before that. If that, I guess, right, Gabe? Yeah. I mean, but he had that really. He had the jackets. He had the painted face. He had the tassels on the arm, which you know, I mean, of course, doesn't fly today. But I mean, it was great. The Road Warriors. What presence they had. I mean, back in the day, that was some. That was so monumental ahead of its time because they had the painted face before the Warrior did. The painted face, and everybody who painted their face later copied the Road Warriors. Um, Sting, when they put Sting up in the rafters. I mean, Sting already was a charismatic individual. Then they put him up in the rafters and made him the Crow character, became even more charismatic. But do you think he would have been charismatic as the Crow if he just had a pair of trunks on and a pair of boots, knee pads, and just stood up in the rafters, no paint on his face, no jacket, no anything, and no baseball bat, no everything, you know, just a guy in a pair of tights up in the back. You're like, what the fuck is that guy in a pair of tights up in the balcony? Oh, maybe he's going to jump. Maybe he's going to kill himself. That'd be interesting. A good suicide? Wrestling? Get out of suicide. Anyway, um, so I mean, you know, the first place to start is a ring jacket. I mean, when I got into business, I always wanted to wear a cape. Because I was like the macho man's cape. See, those really cool capes back in the day. And he had, uh, what he had was like these metal things in them. They came out to his arms, so when he lifted it out, the whole cape came out. And that was like, that was the coolest look. And he had the, the bandana when nobody wore bandanas. Everybody and her mom, girls wore bandanas. But back when the macho man wore it, and he had, not, they weren't Oakleys, I don't think. What were, what were the sunglasses he had before Oakleys? No, I don't know. But they, 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 they were like Oakley-like. But this is before anybody had those. They were like a couple hundred dollar sunglasses, which now is normal, but back in... 84 was, you know, nobody paid more than 10 bucks for a pair of sunglasses. You know, nobody wore bandanas, nobody had the capes. I mean, he had like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of outfits. Um, and you have to make money, you have to spend money. Remind me about that. You have to spend money to make money. Because I, I keep jumping around, so I'll just remind you to remind me. Um, Terry Taylor has this great robe that makes its that makes a, a semi-annual appearance on TNA. Whenever Demore has a match, he'll wear it. Or if Terry has something, he'll wear it. And I think Terry paid like three grand for it, and that was back in '79, '80. You know, it's expensive. Rick Flair's robe's a couple grand, two, three grand. He probably had ten of them at one point, I imagine. But when I got into business, a year and a half into the business. I spent three months, three months in Memphis, ten months in Florida, then I went to Portland. By the time I was six months a year in Portland, two years in the business, I probably had 15 ring jackets. Um, what I would do is I would take jean jackets, and I mean, of course you have to, you know, remember the times, but I would take jean jackets, and I would uh, cut holes in them, and I would wash it so they would all fray. I'd get some neon fabric from the fabric store, and have somebody sew it on in different patterns, buy some fringe at the, at the fabric store, and uh, I had like 15 outfits, you know, and I had matching t uh, tri um, neon um, trunks to go with it. I wanted to be a star. You got to look like a star. Um, you know, and, and people took to me. I mean, literally, I was in the business a year and a half. No, maybe a year and a half when I got my first call to go to WCW, which I turned out. It's a whole other story, but a year and a half into the business. And back then, it took you five to seven years to get a spot on a, on a, in a like in a major company, like in a, like to get to the, to actually become a star. It took you five to seven years of paying your dues before you even got a push. This is a year and a half, and WCW was calling me up to make a six-figure income, guaranteed. When back then, there were no guaranteed deals, and uh, or they were just starting in some some small capacity, and uh, six figures prior to that. I mean, five years before. The fabulous ones were making, and they were the hottest act in the business, and they were probably making 
they, they might have made a hundred grand a year and probably sixty of it were in gimmicks. I mean, so to be called up for that kind of money that soon, I mean, if I would, and, and I mean, granted, at that point I was considered a good worker, but if I was just a good worker, they wouldn't have called me. It was because of my mic skills and my flamboyance and my character and, and the whole package. Because I carried myself like a star, you know. Um, Jerry Jarrett said something to me, uh, to paraphrase him, basically, the whole point is, is that, uh, I mean, let me think how to paraphrase this correct. Um, the best star, basically to the point that usually the best stars, it's be, like, that's who they are. So if, you know, if the guy's a prick, he always ends up being probably a prick in real life. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth to the character. But Jerry Jarrett would much rather deal with the headache of the pain in the ass character if he's a star and he's going to draw money than some guy who's going to go along to get along and not make him a cent. You know, the headache is worth it. You know, Shawn Michaels was a huge headache for years, but it was worth it because he made money, because he made the company money, you know. Um, let's think. So, ring jacket. So, you know, like I said, I wanted to wear a cape, but the cape didn't really fit what I wanted to do. So, I had like a robe. I started with a robe. And that didn't really fit. It was one of those old school robes. And that didn't really fit. So, then I went to the gene things like I talked about. You know, and then I went to the Raven character, and uh, which is more who I was anyway. And even though he was a bare bones minimalist, he still had a whole character that he brought to it. He still had a whole um, star power. The leather jacket, the flannel shirt, the ripped jeans. He looked he looked like the living, breathing embodiment of what he was trying to get across um, of society's dysfunction. So you have to be a star to get people to notice. And if you don't, then you're just, you're just wasting your time and spinning your wheels. Not wasting your time, but you're spinning your wheels, you know, it's, the, um, it's kind of like, like today, all these young guys are like, man, when's my turn? When am I going to get a push? I'm like, that's, they, they go, that's how you guys, like, they think in the old days, we just got a push. Like, okay, it's your turn. You get a push. Gabe, your turn. You get a push. Forget your name again? Rich. Rich, I always forget your name. Rich, it's your turn. You get a push. Uh, Raven, you get a push now. No, it didn't work that way. What happened was, you got over. And if you got over, they patted you on the ass and said, okay, try and run with it. What everybody now wants is they want you to grab you by the wrist and pull you. Okay, come on. It's your turn. Your turn. No, you didn't get turns. You know, you got yourself over. And how did you get yourself over? By being a star. And if you couldn't be a star, you weren't getting over and you were going to stay underneath. And there were tons of good workers back then who never got a chance because they just didn't have any star power. You know, who's going to pay to see it? The, uh... You know, so there's, there's, this business has so much more to it. It's it's funny because the way people are trained today, they're trained by guys who were never in the business. You know, who, who they're, they're trained by guys who were never trained by stars themselves or by people who were good workers or people who were anywhere. So you have these guys who didn't, don't know anything teaching more people who don't know anything. So now you have the blind leading the stupid. You know, it's like Ray, Ray Charles teaching Stevie Wonder how to read. I mean, it, it, it's preposterous. So one of the biggest things is you can learn all the moves, but it's, it's, I mean, I'm getting repetitive, but I'm just trying to emphasize, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be a star. You know, if Ric Flair didn't have the robes, and Ric Flair didn't have the mic skills, and Ric Flair didn't have the bleach blonde hair, and Ric Flair didn't have the strut and the woo and all that, he'd just be another guy. You know, if Shawn Michaels didn't have the ring jackets and the promo skills and the arrogance that was so, so overpowering that made you tune in to watch him, you know, I mean, the, yeah, the work definitely helped, but if he was just a, if he was just a good worker, he, Marty Jannetty, Marty Jannetty is what he would have become. No offense to Marty, because me and Marty are really good friends, but Marty never made the kind of money or had the star power that Sean did. Marty was just as good a worker, but he didn't have the star power. So Sean went to the, skyrocketed, and Marty hung around here. It's a difference, you know? Maybe uh, something about the gear, too, to add is, like, with Raven, like, without you even saying a word, everyone knew what the Raven character was. And, like, Ric Flair with the suit, you knew who Ric Flair was before you even said a word. Which exactly. Is it's, it, yeah, it's how you present yourself. Like, I, like, yeah, you can see what the character's already trying to get across, he, what he is trying to embody. Like, I loved when characters would come out, if they had a promo earlier in the show, they would come out in street clothes, and then later on for their, for their match, they'd come out in their ring gear. I try and tell guys this, and they're like, eh, I don't feel like changing the clothes. I'll, I'll just come out with my thing and you're like Look, they're seeing you twice in a show they should see you in two different things or like I remember talking to Low Key one time and uh, he used to wear a ring jacket and he stopped wearing it I'm like why aren't you wearing your ring jacket he's like well I want to show off my body I'm like you don't think they're going to see it for the 15 minutes you're in the ring so you don't think they're going to see it when you unveil it uh, so I don't know so I mean you know so everybody has their own opinion but I remember um 
they uh, Brian uh, Brian Clark, who was uh, Wrath. So uh, they came with that great, with that cool, that cool gimmick for Wrath, Mortis, and uh, and Vanden Balls as the uh, the curator. What was he the curator of? Uh, human oddities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was it called? <laughs> James Vanderbilt, the curator of human oddities. Wasn't it Cal? It's Cal who had that gimmick. Wasn't it? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some that was Cal's, but I mean Vanderbilt had something with Wrath and Mortis. Remember? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. the, cu- the curator. It was the curator of something. Yeah. Anyway, so they came out, and Canyon would come out there and hey, get the camera. So Kanye would make this big presentation like this. He'd stand out, and then Vandenberg would pull the cape off and pull the accessories off, and it was pretty cool. And Brett Rath hated that, which I don't know why. He just hated it. He wanted to be a wrestler, and which boring. He's going to be a boring wrestler, which I don't get, and uh, I don't know why, but that's what he wanted to be. So he would come walk out, and he had that cool mask over his face and the cape, and as he'd walk to the ring, he would just pull the mask off, pull the cape off, and just drop it. I'm like, that's it? I mean, how dull is that? I mean, the whole, the reason they gave him these outfits is to make a presentation, and there's no presentation. You know, I remember back in the day at house shows, I would get six minutes just taking my robe off because I was a heel and the people hated me. So I would go to take my robe off, and the people would start to boo, and I'd put it back on, and the people would, and then I'd, then I'd go to take it off again, then they'd boo some more, and I'd put it back on, and I'd go yell at this guy or that. And I would, I would get six, I mean, you could get, you could get an hour and a half if you want, but you'd burn the people out, but I would get a lot of time and a lot of entertainment out of the people just by the simple task of just going to unrobe and not unrobe. I mean, Rick Rude would do it, you know, and he'd get tons of mileage out of it. Um, you know, it's, it's crowd interaction. Wrestling is crowd interaction. If you're not interacting with the crowd, then you're not doing your job. You know, if you're just going out there to do spots to entertain yourself, well, then you just, it's like masturbation. You know, this is, this is like sex. You're doing it with the people. When you're just going out there just doing a bunch of spots, by your, to, just to get your spots, you're not listening to the crowd, you're not reacting to them, reacting to you, then you're just masturbating. You know, if, if, you, watch, if you watch acting, good acting, you know, you know, the guy doesn't just say his lines. He listens to what the other guy, acting's, if you talk to any major acting coach, they'll say acting's about reacting. So if, if you're talking, if we're in a scene, and me and Gabe are in a scene, and Gabe's talking to me, and Gabe's going, my dog died, I'm like, oh, it's so sad. You know, yeah, whatever. But if I'm just like waiting for my spot so I can say my lines, I'm like, that's so sad. You're like, wait, wait a minute, you weren't even paying attention. You know, and that's what this is. When you're not listening to the crowd, you're not paying attention. You're rea- they're reacting to you, and you're reacting to them reacting to you. You know, it's just like acting, you know. And so you have to incorporate, and that's all part of being a star, is incorporating all these facets in. You know, um, but, uh, the Vandenberg, the Wrath thing, taking off his thing. Um, I was going to say something else about that. Hold on, who else was I going to talk about? Uh, Components of star power, spend money to make money. Yeah, I spend money to, well, yeah, but I want to, I want to, I want to get, something else about the wrath thing I want to talk about, or somebody similar. Um, let me think if I can think of it. Like the Glacier thing. You know, once Glacier got in the ring, it kind of fizzled out, but they had a cool entrance, you know what I mean? With the cool and the uh, snow and the whole package. I mean, it's pretty interesting. I mean, what shows you can't just have a gimmick to get over, you have to have the whole package. But that's definitely a huge aspect. I mean, it was it was enough to get you interested in the first place. You know, if you don't carry the ball after it, well, that's a whole other matter. But, you know, it's not necessarily ring work that carries it. Because, you know, look at the junkyard dog. I mean, you know, he used to, if, if, you, if you just, all you remember is a junkyard dog from the end of his WWE, WWE days, and you're not watching him. Get some Mid-South or UWF stuff. When he, when he was ruling the roost, I mean, he was so charismatic. He came out the dog chain, he'd get on all fours, start barking. I mean, he was a character, and it wasn't his work rate that got him over. It was his, it was his, um, his, uh, his presence, but his, his relationship with the fans. That's why Dusty was so over, because he was one of them, a Sandman. You have to have a relationship with the fans. If you, you know, like I said, it's just like you know, doing high spots to do high spots. There is no relationship with the fans. The fans want to be inner emotionally tied to you. They want to feel a part of the show. So, you know, there's no other sport. I mean, you go to golf. You know, the guy misses the putt on the 18th hole. He doesn't go, yes, I won, and the crowd goes. Boo! 
Hey, it doesn't happen that way. You know, in baseball, the crowd, if the, or football, if the quarterback's getting ready to, to make a play and the crowd's making too much noise, he settles them down. He doesn't want the crowd to make noise. We want you to make noise. We want, you know, you, we want the audience participation. I remember working one time and there was this, this green kid, I won't say his name, and I think it was, I don't know where it was, but I was like, don't you listen to the crowd? He goes, no, I try not to. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, I'll, I'll be in the corner during tag matches with some underneath, you know, some not underneath, well, I guess underneath is the word, but with some um, independent guys, you know, waiting for the hot tag and the crowd will go. And they'll start getting the, you know, and, and, and it's a double down, let's say. And let's say the crowd is loud as crap by four. But the guy's waiting for a nine count so he doesn't come make the tag, the crowd dies out and then he tags while they're flat. Because he's not listening to the crowd. You know, by the same token, you know, the crowd is making no noise at five, and he calls over and tags me. I'm like, why are you tagging me? There's no noise. Wait for the crowd. Let the people. We'll get the people. You know, you have to have patience in them. You have to believe you'll get them. But without the crowd, it's just, you know, you might as well do it in an empty arena, which, contrary to popular belief, this legendary match between Lawler and Funk in an empty arena didn't do shit for business. Didn't draw a dime. You can ask Lawler and Funk to both tell you. Didn't draw a fucking dime. You know, it's a legendary match now because of its uniqueness. It was interesting, it was cool to watch as a fan from a sort of historical perspective, but at the time it didn't draw a fucking dime. Because there's no crowd. There's no crowd. Um, and, and that's the hardest thing to teach, is uh, star power and listening to the crowd. Um, what are you saying, what was uh, some of the other stuff? Uh, spend money to make money. Yeah, spend money to make money. All these guys are like, yeah, I'm not spending a dime, they don't pay me enough. That. <laughs> well, you know, if you worked at fucking... Um, on Wall Street, you have to buy a bunch of business suits. If you worked, um, if you worked as a fucking carpenter, you have to buy a bunch of tools. If you worked at, um, well, you get the point. This is your job. You are your own investment. So you're investing in yourself. I knew if I spent money on my stuff, my outfits, my look, my costume, my whole character, I knew I'd make it back because I'm investing in me. And if I didn't think I was going to make it back, I'm in the wrong line of work. You know, you have to invest in your product. If you buy a business, if Gabe, Gabe has Ring of Honor, if he didn't invest in Ring of Honor, how would he make any money? If he just goes, all right, I'm going to have a company, but I don't really feel like investing in a ring. So you guys, and I don't want to buy any chairs or stuff or any cameras to film it. So you guys show up, somebody bring um, a camera to film it for me, and then I'll sell it and make a lot of money. And uh, if there's a ring there, great. If there isn't there, it doesn't make any sense. So you are your own product. So if you're not investing in yourself, but an hey, we ain't spending any money. Yeah, the company didn't pay me that. Well, boo, fucking who? Then you know, then you're not going to go anywhere. Why? Why should they invest in you if you're not willing to invest? Like, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, why should they invest in you? If the company's gone, look, this guy, you know, we'd like to push this guy, but the guy won't, you know, the guy doesn't even want to spend the effort himself. You know, what the fuck? You know, it's preposterous. You have to spend money. Well, this is fun. Um, you have to spend. I need some more. Can I need some more water too, somebody. Yeah. Um, you have to Keep spend talking. money. You have to spend money. Look, let's get a shot of Gabe. <laughs> Gabe's got the Booker disease. He's getting a little belly. <laughs> you have to spend money to make money. But the um, you know, and you shouldn't look at it as ah crap. I got to spend a bunch of money. You know, the whole thing is is you're trying to invest in yourself. You know, and you don't have to spend to be expensive. Back to the outfits I was talking about before, the jean stuff I bought. I'd go to TJ Maxx or Marshalls, buy a jean jacket for 35, 40 bucks. Um, I'd buy a bunch of fabric, maybe 30 bucks a jacket worth of fabric. So 65 bucks a ring jacket. I had like 15 or 20 of them. I was making 500 bucks a week plus pictures on the average. So I was probably making about 700, 800 bucks a week, something like that, working in Portland, which is really good money back then, you know, when because uh, all the other territories were dying out except for uh, Memphis and uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, and Memphis wasn't paying anywhere near that, and because um, Don Owens was paying 50 bucks a night, and then in Portland on the uh, house show TV, we would make. The top guys are making like 250, 300, so working six nights a week, 50 times six is 300, 250, 550, and then uh, whatever I sold to selling gimmicks. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so, uh, but still, I mean, you gotta you gotta spend your money. You know, I mean, I know it costs a lot to have a, to make a living, but you know, I guess maybe you have to subsidize and get a stripper to you know take care of you. That's what the boys did in the old days. They would subsidize. That's what, that's what I'm gonna call from now on. Well, you can eBay everything now, anyways. Yeah, you can eBay everything. So you so you buy a bunch of ring jackets, and once you're done with them, you fucking eBay them and sell them, and you make all your money back. So quit fucking crying. Quit being fucking little bunch of baby cunts. You have to spend money to make money. It's a business. It is a fucking business. I don't know what part they don't get about that.
Um, do you think you got to go on the gas to really have star power? Not anymore, no. Not, but you did. I mean, you did back in the day because you couldn't get around not having size. Back then, you had to, like you had to be at least. I mean, like I said, I was 220. I was one of the smallest guys. Pillman was probably one. Probably was 205, but he was shredded. So you know, he's a little smaller. Um, no, and also back then, dieting wasn't easy like it is now. I mean, back then, you couldn't get a grilled chicken sandwich at the drive through Back then, there were no grilled chicken sandwiches. <laughs> back then, there was no dieting. There, there, I mean, there, there wasn't there, the capability to diet. There weren't any metrics weren't even invented. Protein shakes and metrics weren't even invented. Well, I mean, they had the old school protein shakes, but the, the meal replacement metrics came around when I was in New York. The WCW, so it was like 90. Three probably. Before that, there wasn't. You couldn't just get a meal replacement shake to just drink it. They they didn't have that, you know. And the protein shakes were just big, clumpy, old school. You know, didn't mix up, didn't have any flavor. I mean, the the difference between dieting then and dieting now is is so astronomical that now you can diet. Plus, also back then, you were on the road every single day. You worked six nights a week, and when you traveled. You would, um, you know, you would drive everywhere. If you worked for watch, you didn't have time to go to the gym because you had, you know, four or five hundred mile drive one way. You know, a lot of territories you did have time to train. But my point being is, it's well, you didn't have time to train. Doing an hour of cardio that's a whole other matter. You know, um, but now it's so much easier to diet. So yeah, you, you don't need to be on the gas now. You just have to look good. You know, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's much easier to take the gas as a shortcut. And I have no problem with that. You know what I mean? And, and to be honest, steroids really, like any other thing, you know, they're safe in moderation. You know, Lyle Alzado did not die from steroids. What he died from was Jacob's Kreutzfeldt disease, which is what he got from taking growth hormone, uh, not synthetic, but human growth hormone. But I'm sorry, not synthetic human growth hormone, but actual human growth hormone from a cadaver. And the person who had it must say the person they got it from because they were what they would do is they would harvest cadavers and they would get growth hormone from them and um Unfortunately, if somebody had a disease like Jacob's Kreutzfeld, you would get that, it would be passed on. But you can't get that from synthetic growth hormone. But uh, what he, the brain tumor, whatever the hell, brain cancer, you can't get that from steroids. It's just not a side effect. And actually, the main reason people have strokes from uh, steroids is because their blood becomes too thick. It's called high hematocrit. And it becomes too thick. And if you, get your, uh, if you go to a doctor, get your blood work, they'll see you have high hematocrit. And you just go to the, uh, to the oncology center, and they'll uh, phlebotomize you. They'll give you the phlebotomy where they just drain a liter of blood. Which actually you could try doing by gigging yourself, but a liter is a lot of blood. Because I've actually had to do it before. And um, a liter of blood, like I was like, well, I'll just gig myself. And I've gaffed myself pretty deep. But I mean, a liter of blood, that's a fucking ass load of fucking blood. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I don't think storage is necessary, not anymore. I mean, plus you can be 145 now if you're athletic enough. You know, if you're, I mean, Ray Mysterio, as athletic as he is, he's nowhere near the athlete he was seven, eight years ago because his knees are shot, but he's so charismatic he doesn't need to be. You know, if he was just that good an athlete, that would only carry him so far, but at a buck 35 or buck 45, whatever he is, he needs to be charismatic as well, and he is. I mean, he more than is. Do you know what I mean? Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero didn't become a true star until he became charismatic on his own. I mean, because Eddie was team with Art Barr, and... Uh, they were love machines, and, and Art was the character of the team. Art was the, um, he was the charisma, he was the entertainment, and Eddie was, I mean, and a phenomenal worker, but and Eddie was just the, the worker as well. Eddie and ECW was just another worker, just another good worker. It wasn't until they put him in, uh, when did, I guess, when did he start blossoming, WCW or WWE? No, it was WC, towards the end of WCW. Did end of WCW, and WWE when he started Latino Heat and the whole thing, and he became a character. He became bigger than life, and then, Coupled that with his work rate, unbelievable, just so unbelievably talented. But prior to that, if you watch old ECW footage, he wasn't a, he wasn't a star. He was a very, very talented worker, but he wasn't a star yet. He became a star and became a huge megastar, but he wasn't a star at that point. Neither was Benoit. You know, Benoit didn't have that star power back then, and which is a reason why, and because he was small back then, you know. That was the reason he wasn't pushed back then. You know, in Japan, they didn't. That's why they went to Japan because that's where they could get work. Because it was more about work rate than it was about star power. Or at least that's what they claim. But it really, it really wasn't on top. Yeah. Well, we're discussing Benoit and Guerrero. Something about them is that, which um, uh, this is what I'm bringing up for you to discuss next, is they didn't really have any presence back then either. No. And then they grew into presence. How do you get presence? I know it's something that you talked about. I know, like Christopher Daniels, for instance, a couple of years ago. Yeah, he's starting to grow into it finally. Yeah. Like, um, like what do you mean? by presence and how do you get it? Well, you know, actually I was watching this thing on Steve McQueen the other day and Steve McQueen's a famous actor 
uh, for those who don't know who Steve McQueen is. In fact, he was one of the original really cool actors um, who was legitimately like a cool guy in real life. And it carried over, and, and his, his, you know, he was he was an ex-marine. He was, uh, but he was, you know, bust. He was demoted like seven times, so he was a you know really rebellious. Um, and uh, you know, he rode motorcycles. You know, which back then, you know, in Hollywood, like that. You know, most of the, most of the stars back then weren't that. You know. A lot of them weren't really the cool guys they played on TV. That was just an act, you know what I mean? But he legitimately was a, was a legitimate, you know, genuinely uh, cool individual. And so I'm watching this documentary last week, and uh, it, it's actually called The Essence of Cool, the Steve McQueen story or something like that. The Essence of Cool. And, um, and he, he, he carried it over. But what, what I was reading about it, one of the things that they grabbed me the most is that he knew how to steal a scene. Like, um, they're, they're talking about a scene in, in The Magnificent Seven, which was this hugely successful movie at the time, critically and uh, commercially successful. Um, about seven Western guys, which I never actually seen it. I got it on my TiVo. And uh, about seven um, cowboys back in the day that go to do some kind of mission or some kind of crap like that. And, um, and he was, even though he started to become a star, and he was a leading man on some movies. He was second, but he was number two, uh, Babyface, but on Ewell Brenner, and, uh, who was the original bald guy. And uh, that was bald before uh, bald was cool. And um, so he was, the, uh, he was the number two Babyface. And what he did was he literally steals the movie, and, and they're actually talking about this in the, in the documentary. And it was like every time there was a scene with him and Ewell Brenner, he made sure that you watched him instead of Ewell Brenner without taking anything away from Ewell Brenner. Because there's a way to steal a scene... Like like when Yul Brenner like there's a scene with just him and Yul Brenner riding the, you know riding the, the stagecoach, but he has all these little mannerisms and quirks and little things like he's playing with his hat or he's checking his watch or you know I don't think they had watches back then but whatever. So in all these little things where you can't take your eyes off him, even though he's not doing anything, and there's a way to do that. And I, I tell guys like Daniels that there's a way to steal the scene without taking away, because you can't take away from the other guy because that's, then you're stepping on him, and that's, that's unfair, and I don't believe in that. But there's a way to steal a scene. It's like when I'm, when I'm being a heel, I want you to watch me get beat up, not have the guy, not watch the guy beat me up. And, and there is a distinction between the two, even though it sounds like the same thing, but it isn't. Um, I remember watching a match where this really stuck out to me. It was Lawler versus uh, Funk, and I was in uh, Global. And I think I was commentating. I think that's why I was out there. And um, so uh, Lawler was a babyface. And, and Lawler is one of the greatest workers of all time. I mean, Lawler will steal any scene he's in. If you put him in anything, you, will, you can't take your eyes off him. And I watched Funk come down. And Funk spent 20 minutes just getting into the ring. By the time he screwed with the fans and fucked around and took his fucking... Uh, his, um, whatever that thing is, the serape off, and his whip, and his branding, or not his whip, his branding iron, and his hat, and fuck with people, and fuck with the commentators, and fuck with Lawler, and tried to get in the ring, and this and that, and did all this production, and I'm thinking, fuck, Lawler's got to stomp his ass. I mean, Lawler literally was just standing there like this. He had nothing to do, and Funk wasn't fucking him, because Funk's job as a heel was to get over and get the people pissed, and that's what he was doing. There was nothing Lawler could do, and there was nothing wrong with him doing it, because he wasn't fucking Lawler, but you couldn't take your eyes off Law uh, Funk, and I never, like, I just, you couldn't take your eyes off him, and I just thought, whatever Lawler's doing, I glanced in the ring, and Lawler was doing nothing, because he couldn't do anything. There was nothing for him to do, you know? And that's how you steal the scene, and that, that's an art form that comes with learning how to work, not how to have technical matches, but how to work, um, and how to interact with fans, and how to position yourself, um, and part of being a star. I mean, if you just go out there, you just walk to the ring, and they go, Joe Blow, and you raise your arm and you put it down, well, that's kind of, not very, it's not very exciting. You know, if you come out there and you do a little kung fu motion, that's a little more interesting, and, and you build on that. I mean, and you build up ticks and quirks and little idiosyncrasies, like uh, Lisa Kudrow on, uh, as Phoebe. She had all these little quirks and idiosyncrasies that made her interesting as a character to watch. Um, the, uh, and now she's doing another show, and it's, it's a little weird because she's doing some of the same stuff as a different character. So, you know, some of it works, some of it doesn't. Because a lot of it's just identifiable with Phoebe. Um, and Steve McQueen was like that. He stole every scene he was in. And so, you know, and he actually would, it got to the point, I guess, where he didn't, need, he didn't even want a lot of dialogue in his movies. Didn't need it. Because he knew he could steal the scene without even having any dialogue. 
you know, the, I mean, without having much dialogue. You know, um, Clint Eastwood, he never said much. But it, what he said, and he carried himself, and he said it in such a way that he didn't need a whole lot of dialogue. He, need, he conveyed what he was trying to convey with such a charismatic tone and such star power that you're mesmerized where you can't take your eyes off him whether he's talking or not. Um, so it makes De Niro such a great actor. When you're watching De Niro, if you're watching two people in a scene, De Niro, you can see him truly listening to what the person's saying and taking it in and reacting to it in such a way that you can't take your eyes off him even though somebody else is talking to him, you know? Well, is it more like a facial expression kind of thing? Or it, 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 it's hard to explain. That's one of it. It's facial expression. It's body language. It's the, you know, the way you stand, the way you carry yourself, the way you react to it. Um... The um, what you're wearing, how you look. I mean, you know, if you're supposed to be a slob and you look like a slob, you know, if you're supposed to be a drunk fucking derelict, you know, if your character is a drunk derelict and he's out there wearing a you know a suit, you're like, I'll give you the best example. Back in the day, everybody had to wear suits. Back in the old days, um, because they had a profession, had to look like a star. You, had, you know, now I guess they're trying to reinstate that in New York. But back in the day, you know, you had to look like a star. Except characters like um, like um. Haystacks, Calhoun, they wouldn't put him in a suit. I mean, A, they were, you couldn't find a suit that would fit him because he was 600 pounds, which is probably means he was 400. But anyway, but besides that, because he was a hillbilly. What the fuck would a hillbilly be doing in a suit? And guys like that, if Watts ever caught you out of gimmick, you would get fired because you had to make the part believable. So if you're a barefoot hillbilly and all of a sudden you're driving around in a Jaguar, Watts would be like, you're out of my territory or sell the fucking car because you're not conveying what needs to be conveyed. And back then, you know, smaller territories, you know, people believed it, which, of course, nobody did, but, you know, I mean, I'm sure a percentage did, but still, nevertheless, you get the point. So, you have to look the part, you have to be the part. Um, that's why Raven was so easy for me, because I just took it from my childhood, you know. It wasn't like I had it, and that's why, you know, wrestlers aren't the greatest actors, and that's why we all play characters that are very close to ourselves, because it's much easier than trying to, you know, actually act. Because, you know, if we were actors, we'd probably, you know, if we were better actors, we'd probably go into acting. Although, I don't think anybody could be as bad an actor as Anakin Skywalker. Hayden Christensen, he was more wooden than George Washington's teeth. That thing, fuck, he was rotten. Was he not the fucking most rotten fucking actor of all time? I didn't watch Star Wars. So. Ah, you know, the, the fucking the second one, he was just atrocious. And so you figure now, it's been three years, he has some acting lessons. Fuck, he's just horrible. I mean, he's like this. I can't believe you. Lying, please. <laughs> He's like the guy in a poker commercial or with a poker face. Uh, he just won a million bucks. Your girlfriend just fucked the cat. Um, I can't think of anything else funny. <laughs> you know. Um, but then Richard Lewis. Remember Richard Lewis, the comedian? Yeah. What a neurotic schlemiel he was. But his character, the way he carried himself, his mannerisms, he'd be like, ah, and he'd run his fingers through his hair, and he'd be like, ah, he'd, he'd walking around the stage stressing about everything. You know, if he was just reading his material about how, um, you know, how his life's a mess, and was just like, ah, my life's a mess. Uh, it's not really. It's not as interesting. Everyone on Seinfeld's a good example of that too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. So, Kramer, you believed that Kramer was a complete idiot. I mean, he was a ridiculous goofus. You know, a hipster doofus, as uh, Elaine called him. You know, Seinfeld. He was very meticulous. You know, his, his house was perfectly neat. His clothes were always perfectly neat. And if he didn't, if it wasn't that way, you, it wouldn't make any sense. And so he, you have to carry yourself. Um, the comedians especially, because they're alone with a microphone. So they have nothing but their presence. Like there's this, uh, the amazing Jonathan. You ever seen him? He's like a comedian magician. He's, he's out of his fucking mind, but his hair's sticking out everywhere. You know, or like, um, or like Bobcat Goldthwait, his hair sticks out everywhere. Goes, <laughs> because, you know, but you have to convey the part. If you're not looking or acting or behaving, you know, and then you have to do it in an in a, in a over-the-top, larger-than-life way. Um, it's much easier to be so far over the top they pull you back as opposed to being here and they have to push you forward. Um, and I guess a lot of it, I guess a lot of it has to do with being self-conscious. Um, Sharon's one of my closest friends in the business and he was, I thought he did his best stuff when he was wearing a skirt because he put on the skirt like his Marilyn Manson thing with the, with the uh, what's that called? The bustier. Yeah, the bustier kind of thing or whatever. And um, and he had different colored eyeballs and the whole nine yards. And, and, I, and I guess at some point in his head, he's like, how can I be self-conscious? I'm wearing a goddamn dress. You know what I mean? And he stopped being self-conscious. You know, 
And then when they uh, went back to being just Saren, he was more self-conscious, you know, behind the microphone and stuff. And then they gave him a mop, and now he's like, well, I gotta be self-conscious. I'm fucking talking to a mop, you know. And so, if you're self-conscious, and you're like, man, everybody's looking at me. Well, you're in the wrong business. I mean, you want everybody, you want everyone to be looking at you. You want them to be staring at you. You know, and if you're like, oh, fuck. That's why you have to commit uh, You have to commit to stuff. Uh, so make a note of that. I'll get back to that. You have to commit to it. Um, the, uh, but you, you can't be self-conscious. You can't feel inhibited. Like, to me, like, I come alive. You put me in front, I mean, I, yeah, I put me in front of a camera. I, I open up twice as much. Oh, we have a visitor. Oh, we have just a finger. Is that my food? Get my food, you bastard. Uh, Rich, the cameraman, leaving. Which, uh, what are we going to do without him, being that the cameras are on tripods? <laughs> oh, good gosh. What will we do? Um, the, um, but you have to commit to the character. You have, you have to be, you can't be self-conscious. You can't feel inhibited. Because if you feel uncomfortable with all eyes on you, you can only go so far. I mean, look at McMahon's swagger to the ring. You know, he's not self-conscious. He wants you to watch him. You know, The Rock wants you to watch him. I want you to watch me. You know what I mean? That's why I'm in his business. I want the attention. You know, the reason people, the reason most people go into acting or any celebrity field is because they are, are insecure and they want attention. And then if you can't handle the attention once you get it, then you're in the wrong business. You know, I mean, this, to be to be famous, there has to be something missing in, you know, generally there's something missing in your own life that, that you need the adulation of perfect strangers, you know, but if you can't handle the adulation, then you're in the wrong business. Um, so you got to be so you can't be self-conscious at all. You have to, and you have to commit to the character. If your character is a moron, and uh, I remember one time where, uh, I got so mad at Stevie Richards. I, I love Stevie. And I got so mad. Uh, back then, we and him didn't get along at all. I mean, we, I mean, we got along when we fought like cats and dogs. And uh, I got so mad at him. Because he was supposed to do a joke uh, about Big Dick Dudley. Where he goes, I love Big Dick. Now listen, what do you mean the rabbit died? Oh, we're back. Look at my phone, Gabe. All right, what are we talking about? Uh, Big Dick Dudley, Stevie Richards. Oh, right, right. So, so Stevie... Um, Stevie's character was supposed to be a bit of a, a nitwit, and uh, so he's supposed to be like, like talking about how he loves Dick, Big Dick Dudley, but he's like, I love Big Dick, you know, except that he didn't want to be embarrassed by it because he was feeling really self-conscious, so he didn't want to say I love Big Dick, but he, but he knew he had to, so he wanted to say it in such a way where everybody knew that he was in on the joke, which of course, if he's in on the joke, that kind of ruins the joke. Um, so he was like, he's like, I love Big Dick. Uh, actually, wait, hold on, let me think. How do he say it? However he said it, he goes, he goes, I love Big Dick. And like almost like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I know I'm in on the joke, and I'm like, you fucking jackass. You can't do it like that. You have to do it like, like oh, I love Big Dick. You know, where you have no idea you're saying that you love Big Dick. That's why it's funny. If you know you're saying it, it's not funny anymore. And because he was so self-conscious, because he's already wearing. Oh, the fights I had with him trying to get him into the Daisy Dukes was ridiculous. You know, because Raven came out with these long jean shorts ripped up. So the Stevie character was a. You know, the, the idea was his character was a big mark for mine. So. He wanted to emulate me, and so I had the ripped up t-shirts, you know, with the rock and roll bands, and, um, but you know, Stevie in his own nitwit style, not him personally, but his character, not Michael Manna, but Stevie Richards, the character, well, he thought, well, Raven's wearing jean shorts, I'll wear jean shorts, but I want to look cool, in his mind, he's cool, so he wears Daisy Dukes, which look you know, really gay on a guy, and then instead of wearing, like, a black concert shirt, you know, like a long hanging, you know, messy, you know, fucked up one. He'd wear a half shirt and he'd cut it nice and high to show off his, his abs. And he'd wear like Warren, you know, or some other gay band. You know what I mean? And so his the whole point was his character didn't get the Raven character. He was a mark for it and then he didn't quite get it on the same level that Raven got. He was just, so he was trying to emulate it, but in his own nitwit fashion, he ended up looking like a jackass, which is what makes it entertaining. Um, and I had a fight with him tooth and nail because he didn't want to look like a jackass. Nobody wants to look like a jackass. And I'm like, look, I've, you know, when I was Scotty the Body, when I, when I went to Portland, the first thing Piper made me do was, uh, he hired me, gave me three weeks to get over, which is how it should be done. If you can't get over in three weeks, then you don't really belong there. Um, you didn't get you didn't get hired and get a contract for a year or six months, you know, or ninety. You know, that's another thing they don't get. You know, make me talk. I want to talk about that. Everybody thinks you know now they you know everybody gets contracts and hired for a length of time. I want to talk about that. Okay, so anyway, so Piper goes. This is when we and so he goes. I'm going to make you the first heel commentator we've had in Portland because I was a heel commentator in Florida with Gordon Soley, and. Uh, because when we come on the air, I want you to pick your nose. 
you know, so we're like, so I'm like, we kind of end, like, I'm like, ah, you know, because then they'll call you Snotty the Body, and it'll give you an instant recognition with the fans, you know, Scotty the Body, because I was calling myself Scotty the Body, so I'm picking my nose, they'll call me Snotty the Body, and it'll instantly get the fans to interact with me on a level that takes a lot longer normally to get there, you know, unless you find some way to get there faster, and I'm thinking, I don't want to do that, but you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say no, because back then you couldn't say no, now people say, ah, I'm not doing it, well, well, we'll change it, well, back then there was no changing, if I would have said no, I, I never would have got the job, so I'm like, and on some level, I completely trusted Piper. I knew he knew what he was doing, but I didn't want to look stupid. You know what I mean? I, I was willing to look stupid in certain aspects, but I didn't want to look that fucking stupid. And then, but once, once, but I did it anyway because I had to. And once I did it, that completely turned a switch in my head, and I got the business. You know what I mean? And so, uh, so I would come on the air, and I'm like, "Oh, we're back." And then, like, and so then, the, you know, of course, for a rib, Piper goes, "Oh, we lost the footage." So the next week, I had to pick my nose again. And by then, I realized, you know what? This isn't bad at all. And what I ended up doing was I made these eight by tens of me picking my nose and talking to the other commentator. And then I would sell them at the matches, but I wouldn't let the fans know that I personally was selling them. So they would think that the baby faces were selling them, and they would all buy them. And then I would get to the ring, and I'd hold one of these up, and I'm like, "All right, who's selling these? If any of you fans buy this picture, I'll leave. I'll never come back." So of course, people would rush to the stands, they'd buy them, I would get all mad, I'd throw a fit, the baby faces would parade around the ring holding the picture, you know, me picking my nose, eh, with my finger, you know, like, way up my nose, and I made a fortune off it, you know, because the people thought they were getting to me, and I'm like, schmucks, I'm getting to you, I'm selling the pictures, but they had no idea, so, you can't be self-conscious, I mean, you know, it's like, uh, there's been a lot of shit ass crappy crappy gimmicks like Johnny Polo. I didn't want to be Johnny Polo. Yeah, it's it's not me. I'm not a rich upper crusty you know Connecticut kind of guy. I I don't speak that way. So there's always going to be a disconnect, um, which Vinci Vinci finally you know finally eventually realized because I don't speak like a guy like that. I have my own particular vocal pattern, my own idiom, and it doesn't sound anything like a Connecticut guy. So no matter how much you dress me in the part, I'm never going to be the part. But um. I figured if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go all out. And I came up with, I think, some pretty fucking hilarious shit. You know, because I figured Johnny Polo's a man of leisure. They wanted me to have an Apollo mouth. I'm like, well, I could get really old quick. So then I started bringing different stuff. I remember one time I came out with um, scuba gear. And I came out with the big flippity flopper. You know, so of course I'm making extra production trying to walk with him. You know, in a snorkel. And one time I came out with a, with a lawn chair with a Hawaiian drink in it. But of course I had a giant drink this big. And I taped um, flat, uh, the uh, umbrellas to it because I had to put some umbrellas in a drink, and, and I didn't know this at the time, but Nova told me that that was the mad that he was the job that fought Adam Bomb, and I dumped the, uh, the Hawaiian drink on him. I'm pretty sure it was Nova. Anyway, um, but my whole point being is that, uh, you know, so uh, as a heel, anyway, you're going to look stupid, and that's one of the hardest things to get baby faces is like, they don't want to look dumb. Well, be a heel then, and that's why everybody should have to be a heel first, so they understand that at some point, they're going to lose, at some point, they're going to look dumb. And then it's much easier to be a baby face because otherwise they'll, that's why baby faces, generally if you, in real life you'll find that the baby face are not nearly the nice people heels are because heels are more content with themselves and willing to make an ass of themselves and, and baby faces are usually more prima donnas and you'll find that in the business, at least that's the way it's been for years. Um, Although now it's a lot different because most of the guys aren't baby faces or heels. I mean, they may be considered a heel or a baby face, but they don't work like a heel. So you're not really a heel. But, but where I'm going with this is Vince McMahon, who's the billionaire, at the time was a billionaire, the, the, you know, one of the wealthiest men in the world at the time, um, owned the company, and he shot, shoots an angle where Austin pulls a cap gun on him, it says bang, and he pisses himself on TV. Which I don't think there's anything more humiliating than peeing your pants out of fear. And I'm like, well look, the guy's a billionaire, he's willing to pee himself, he pee his pants out of fear. Really, how stupid, you know, if you're not willing to look stupid, and this guy's the billionaire owner, who could, doesn't have to make himself look stupid at all, is willing to pee his pants out of fear, you're really gonna have a hard time convincing me that your character wouldn't look stupid. Do you know what I mean? Everybody's going to look stupid. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us flawed human individuals. That's what makes us interesting. We all have the capacity to look stupid. Um, and if you're going to be self-conscious, you're only going to go so far because you're never going to get the people to relate to you on a, you know, a larger-than-life level. What was the last thing I, I want to get back to that I said something about? You said a bunch about a component to star power. That was a one. No, no, but I, but I was just. I said, remind me of something. When I was just making this discord. Um, uh, rant. Committing to stuff. No, just recently. I don't know. Yeah. Um, 
Let me think. I didn't write anything down. You so. suck. Gabe's the absent-minded professor. <laughs> he doesn't even have the key, know where the keys to the building are. He can write TV, he can produce TV, but ask him where the keys to the building are, he has no idea. His hair is growing like Albert Einstein, sticking up everywhere, like a mad genius. Um, yeah, you have to commit to it. You have to be willing to be the character. You have to be willing to look stupid. You have to be, can't be self-conscious. You have to look like a star. You have to act like a star. You have to carry yourself like a star. How about explaining that? Because a lot of guys don't know how to carry themselves. Yeah, like well, the minute you walk through the curtain, you are the character. You are a star. And if you walk through and you just walk out and just walk to the ring, it's not really that very interesting. But if you walk out and you're, you know, whatever it is your character does, whether it's, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, he pumps the crowd up, or walks with intensity, or walks with a strut, or whatever he does, you're setting the tempo for the match. You're presenting a picture of what you want the people to see before you've ever set foot in the ring. The minute you come through the curtain, you're setting the tempo for who your character is. You know, Jeff Hardy comes out, and he does his little running thing, he's got the paint on his face, and it's pretty cool looking. Um, you know, uh, the... Uh, who else? I'm trying to think. I don't watch much wrestling anymore. I love performing more than ever, but wrestling doesn't really seem to excite me anymore because there are no interesting storylines. I mean, not none, but there's very few interesting storylines and very few interesting characters. I haven't watched it in like three years. I mean, I love performing more than ever, but nothing's grabbed my attention. I mean, one of my favorite angles ever was when, uh, one of my favorite interesting segments was when, uh, Austin comes up on the, on the Titan trial or rocks in the ring and he's like uh, this is back when everybody had beepers before cell phones became cheap enough for everybody to have and um, he goes when you see when you see your beeper go off 316 he goes I'm going to kick your ass and of course you think Austin's somewhere else because he's in the Titan Tron and Rock's beeper goes off he looks at his beeper and his eyes bug out and all of a sudden it's his 316 and there's Austin fucking bah, 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 and just mauls the crap out of him I mean it entertained us so much that me, Canyon, Disco, Saturn um, I mean, like five or six of us, we would literally just beep one of somebody when like five of us would get together and beep like, you know, Disco or Kidman, and then he'd look at his beeper, see 316, and the rest of us would go jump him and beat the crap out of him. <laughs> yeah, it, just, it was an entertaining game. But the, um, you know, if Rock wasn't the character he is, and he didn't sell it the way he did, where his eyes, you know, oh my God, and he has that face, and if Austin doesn't, you know, have that intensity that comes across where you believe that he's going to kick your ass, you know, and then he would do this type of thing, you know, like whereas if um if uh if Lawler said it, they, you don't really believe that because that's not Lawler's character. Lawler's character wouldn't say, "You see 316, I'm going to whoop your ass." You know what I mean? It's just not something he would do. Um, if you see um who else? I mean, if you know, it's not something Canyon would do. It's a, it, it's something that Austin would do. I mean, there's other characters that would do it, but. You have to be who your character is. You have to understand your character. You have to know what your character would say. Like, I'm in a locker room sometimes, and uh, I'll be working with Shane, and he's like, ah, I don't think the franchise would do that. And some guys get pissed. They're like, ah, I want a mark for his character. I like that. I want a guy to know what his character would do. Because if your character wouldn't, you know, unless you're trying to protect them too much, you just don't want to look stupid. But if you know what your character does, it's so much easier to work with you and, and to tell a story because... Um, you know, you you know the you know the elements of it. You know, like if I go to I go to these young guys today, I'm like, well, what's your character? I don't know. Like that's pretty fascinating. <laughs> that's exciting. Uh, I'm a guy who does high spots. Good. That'll get the people behind you. I, how, how are they going to get behind you? There's nothing to relate to. There's nothing to identify with. You know, when you watch um, what's a when you watch 24, you know. The characters, the characters that stand out are like that Chloe chick. She's so persnickety and so fucking annoying. You know, and everybody can relate to that because either they know somebody who's annoying or they are annoying or, they, you know, they have a friend. Who, you, know, there's, you can relate to that character, but she does it in such a way. She carries herself in a way. She talks in a way. She makes the facials that go with it. You want to beat the piss out of her. But, but it's very identifiable and it's very easy to relate to and to get behind it. So she stands out. 
Um, and that's why she steals every scene she's in. Jack Bauer steals, you know, Kiefer Sutherland steals every scene because he just has this intensity that you believe that he's the baddest man on the planet. Um, if you watch Alias, the father, you know, who doesn't say anything, have very few words, but you're like, this is the, this is the baddest CIA, sneakiest motherfucker on the planet because he carries himself in such a way, delivers his lines in such a way that you're like, oh yeah, I believe he does that. You know, I believe he can kick some ass. And, and to be honest, he's not the most... When you actually put him in an action scene, he's not the best at it. But his acting is so good in every other way that you can, you're like, oh, I can let that slide. You know, because he doesn't look like a tough guy when he actually gets into the actual action part of it. But that's so few and far between because his character is more of a manipulator and pulling the strings. You know, or he's getting beat up and he's taking the pain, like, you know, superhumanly. Like, like I remember there was a scene where, um, or Sloan, you ever watch Alias? No. Fucking tremendous. You gotta watch Alias. It's a fucking great show. They all the, you get the DVDs. But there's this character, Sloan, who's like the evil bastard. Well, not this season, he's a baby face now, but he's a heel for the first two seasons before he turned. And, um, and so he's the head of the heels, right? And, uh, and he's such a ruthless, evil motherfucker. He, you know, kills people left and right just for crossing them. I mean, just the evil, ruthless motherfucker. And there's a scene where he, um, he somehow is strapped to something and he can't escape for whatever reason. I can't remember the specifics, but something to the fact where they need a fingerprint of him to stop some device from going off. But he's strapped and they can't get him free to stop it in time. So he's like, all right, cut off my finger. And they fucking, and so they, they cut off his finger to get the fingerprint. And like, and this, this actor, I would, any other thing I've ever seen him in, you wouldn't put him as a tough guy. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't even think that his character would remotely, you know, do this. You'd think he'd be a sniveling weenie, but the way he carries himself in this, you're like, oh, fuck. You know, you believe that he would fucking let his finger get cut off, you know, and that he would just, uh, you know what I mean, and just fucking eat it and bite it and grin and take it, you know. So, if you have nothing to deal with, nothing to identify with, nothing for us to get behind, how, how do we put anything behind you? I mean, how do we how do we get with you? How do we become intrigued? You know, you're just a cog in the machine. Um, I was talking to AJ Styles about that. I was like, you need to have, yeah, AJ's just phenomenal in the ring, but his promos while not bad, there's nothing to get behind, there's nothing to identify with, there's nothing to relate to. And uh, I was explaining this to him and, and I was like, and I gave him some uh, some ideas and he actually came up with one of his own that's really, really good and uh, that I think he's going to incorporate and he was talking about how, I guess, I guess he was, his family was dirt poor and I guess, I mean, they, they were so poor they couldn't afford a TV, I'm like, then that's your point of view. You came from this poverty, talk about that, incorporate it into your story. You know, incorporate that into your promo, make that a part of your character, because everybody, like, you know, can either identify with somebody being really poor, or can sympathize with it, or they are poor, and all of a sudden, now we can feel a kinship, it intrigues us, it makes your character more human, makes it more three-dimensional, makes it more realistic, makes it more identifiable with, so that, um, so that you become a character as opposed to just a phenomenal athlete because phenomenal athletes are you know it's only so interesting up to so far you know what I mean you can only go so far with it so um, that's why uh, remember Jim McMahon the quarterback yeah you know, he fucking wasn't even that great a quarterback but he had that whole persona that whole thing and the glasses and the fucking bandana and the whole thing where you're like you know he got all that for Anna Kornikova she can't play tennis for her ass you know what I mean I could probably beat her well, I couldn't beat her I can't play tennis but I could beat her in ping pong but the thing is but she's so fucking hot that she's like wow fuck she's you know that they would much rather you'd much rather watch her play tennis than all these other people even though they're better just because of her just her looks alone you know um how about while you're on that talking about appearance because a lot of indie guys you know they're not tan or yeah they're not tan they have these really you know what I'm saying they're the cheapest fucking I wonder about the costumes the outfits too they buy their fucking outfits with a really thin cheap ass spandex and it looks cheap I mean if it looks cheap it is cheap and if it, and even if it isn't cheap if it looks cheap then you look like it, you look like you spent no money on it I mean there's guys wearing these outfits and I'm like Fuck, that's some pretty fucking crappy ass looking fabric. There's this guy up and um, who works for Mikey Whipwreck that uh, comes up with uh, make, like Mikey has his new stuff. Have you seen? No. Really good stuff, like really high quality looking stuff. You know, much more high quality than fucking most. And uh, 
I mean, I'm going to bring him around and try and get him some more work and uh, and to give some boys some better stuff. But yeah, you know, just a lot. Of, if you just got really cheap stuff, it just looks cheap. You you want to spend some money to make. We talked about that before, but but you know, if you're going to buy fabric, buy the thicker fabric, buy stuff that looks more quality. Don't you know? Unless your character's supposed to be poor, you know. Like Raven was supposed, to, you know, he's supposed to look like a, a, a derelict. That's why he had the ripped up jean shorts and the ripped up t-shirts. You know, that's why I made sure I didn't wear any brand new concert shirts because Raven wouldn't wear that. You know. What was your question now? Like just overall how your appearance should be in order to have star power, how important appearance is. Yeah, I mean, hair. yeah, tanning. Tan, I mean, yeah, if you, if, I mean, some people look better white. Like Brian Knob should should never have a tan. You know, Knob should look like a whale. You know what I mean? That's, that's what he, the nasty boys should look nasty. They're fucking scumbags. They should look like it. You know what I mean? They were over like motherfuckers, but they should look the part. Um, that's why Haystacks Calhoun, or, you know, was always told he had to wear the hillbilly outfit everywhere to look the part. But, um... Yeah, you should have a decent body because nobody wants to see a guy with you know an unpresentable build, especially these these little skinny guys with no muscle tone. I mean, how 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 am I supposed to believe as a fan? Remember, we're suspending disbelief, so we have to believe that you're going to kick somebody's ass. I don't care if you're the baddest shooter in the world if you don't look the part or carry yourself to the part. I can't believe it as a fan. Now, it doesn't matter that Hoist Gracie at 150 could beat some guy 320. That doesn't mean that every that we think that every other 150 pounder could beat a 320. No, you have to look like you belong in the ring. You should be tan, at least or at least have some kind. You know, unless I mean, you shouldn't be white as a ghost. Um, you know, you should have a, a you should have a stylish hairdo. Um, that sounds rather gay. But I remember, you know, you know, unless like I mean, like Shawn Michaels was able to get away with wearing a mullet like five years after it went out of style, and Eddie Guerrero gets away with wearing a mullet. But for the most part, I mean, if you don't wear something that looks cool, if your character's supposed to be cool, right? And he's wearing, and he has a, hair, a look, that, a hairstyle that's not in style. Or is, is when he comes to do interviews, if he's in street clothes and they're not very cool. Well, how am I supposed to take you as a cool character if you look like a dork? You know, like I remember, um, I'm not even going to name who it is, but there's one guy on TNA who's supposed to be a very cool character, and, and I like the guy a lot, but his clothing that he wears to the shows was in style five years ago, and is so out of style now, and yet he still wears it, and if he wore it, and, and occasionally, I don't think he ever wears it on interviews, but if he did, it'd be like, you would kill your own gimmick, you know what I mean? Um... Yeah, if Raven were to wear, do an interview on street clothes, and he were to wear uh, a white blazer, you know, with a, with a green tie, I'd be like, what the fuck? Why, why the fuck is Raven wearing, you know, it, it just wouldn't make any sense. It, it's complete disconnect. It, it doesn't make any sense for the character. So you have to look the part, and you have to be the part. And the minute you walk through the curtain, to the minute you're back through the curtain, you're the character. And another thing I hate what guys do is, once they get up the ramp, they stop being a character. No, you're not out of character until you're behind the curtain and the curtain closes. You know, the curtain has to close behind you. Otherwise, I've seen guys like, um, you know, the fucking, uh, yeah, I'll I, I give you an example. Like uh, Triton, um, what's his name? Um, the, the guy Hogan likes. Yeah, yeah, we're well, very nice guy, very nice guy. And, and he's green and, and he knows it and he's learning. Is it here? You suck. Um, and he's learning and he knows it. But um, one of the mistakes he made, I mean, and, and this isn't really his fault because somebody should have told him. Um, they had his big entrance for him. They did some kind of thing with him and Monty and the lights went out. And when the lights came back on, somebody caught us, they caught a shot of him in the ramp. And uh, and just you know walking back and just you know wasn't looking like this he was like this you know just you know kind of walking back you know like a normal guy it's not really his fault somebody sh they never should have taken a shot and if they were gonna take a shot they should have told him and even if they didn't like me I, I don't get out of character till I know there is no camera on me you know and he does he's not been in the business long enough to know it but it's just really odd it was really strange like uh, you know. Because it's an illusion. We're, we're creating an illusion for the fans that we are who we claim to be out there. And if you're supposed to be this badass motherfucker, and then you come back through the curtain, but the camera's still on, you're like, man, I fucking my my fingernail. I broke my fingernail. <laughs> what? It doesn't make it doesn't work. You know. Um. And uh, let's take a break for a sec. the character Jimmy Fallon does the radio guy goes and we're back and he screams into the microphone on Saturday Night Live you have to commit to the character I mean it's, just, it's a ridiculous DJ who um, screams into the microphone every time they come back and it just it's hilarious but if he didn't commit to it it just wouldn't have any resonance um, do you have any water my food here and you stink 
Ah, bastard. Um, and in many ways, you know, ultimately, and I've avoided this the entire time, but because it's the hardest thing to talk about, but ultimately it's about charisma. And having charisma, the X factor, so hard to define. You know what I mean? You know it when you see it. How do you, and some people say if you don't have it, you can never have it. You can't create it. Um, I think on some level, everybody has some kind of potential to be charismatic. You know, you have to tap into that inner part of yourself that, you know, and tapping into it's the hardest thing. Um, for some, some people it's just easy, you know what I mean? Um, I know it's kind of vague, but it's, it's really hard to describe. I mean, you just know, when you, you know Hogan has charisma. You just know it when you see it. Um, you know the uh, you know that Ric Flair does. You know that Austin does. You know that Rock does. And I mean, a lot of times it's hard to define. So I guess what I'm trying to get across is that you want to do everything in your power to minimize whatever lack of charisma you have, so that and enhance whatever charisma you do have. So you want to try and bring out as much natural charisma as you have, and you want to do everything else around it so that not only does it magnify what charisma you have, but if you have less than, all these other things fill in the blanks. They fill in the holes. Um, I will talk about promos because promos are so important, but I think that's a whole other lecture. That's a whole for a whole other time. Um, and to get into it now, we wouldn't even do it any. It would just do it a complete disservice. But. Um, how about any subtle things you can do in a match to? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a little. You, know, you want to have quirks. You want to have, like, you know, my character does a lot of pig snorting, you know, looking around, you know, and thinking, you know, and you know, contemplating what his next move is. I mean, the character like the spoiler, yeah, old school character. Yeah, you know, he was very methodical. Um, you know, the Sandman didn't care. You know, the Sandman would just take his time and have a cigarette and a beer. You know what I mean? You, everybody has their own quirks. Um, and I can't give you quirks. I mean, you know, like some guys, like when they punch a guy, they they sell their hand like they fucked up their knuckle. I mean, really, if you really punch some guy in the head, a lot of times you really fuck up your knuckles. Which is actually why uh, mixed martial arts is actually why they, uh, why bare knuckle fighting is actually safer than boxing gloves. Because with a glove, you don't break your knuckles. So you can punch a guy like 8,000 times, whereas, you know, you punch a guy, you know, enough times in the head, you're going to break your knuckles. Uh, nice. Um, that's a whole other lecture. Um, for John McCain. Um, but, I mean, everybody has, you know, their own little stuff that they do. And if you don't, then you need to think of stuff to do, you know, and what fits your character. It's very hard to come up with. I mean, if this was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, it's very easy. I mean, that's why the WWF at some point was coming up with, okay, we'll have a hockey player, the goon. We'll have a toilet guy, T.O. Hopper. We'll have, you know, we'll have a dentist, Isaac Yankum. I mean, because if everybody could, because what they didn't get, what they didn't understand was, they were creating gimmicks. What gets over is personalities. Terry Funk's a personality. Ric Flair's a personality. Hulk Hogan's a personality. Um, a larger-than-life personality. A star personality. You want to be a star character. Um, you know, so it's looks. It's charisma. It's appear. I mean, well, looks and appearance are pretty similar, I guess. Um, it's how you carry yourself. It's how you walk to the ring. It's how you perform in the ring. I mean, I'll give you another great example. When I was uh, Scotty Flamingo and Johnny Polo and Scotty, well, not Johnny Polo, but Scotty Flamingo and Scotty the Body, I was considered a pretty good hand. I was considered a pretty good worker, and I was always the guy that had to put over the uh, the guy who was going to get the, the, uh, the push to the, I, I was always right. When I was in Portland and every place else, Portland I was on top, and uh, but whenever they bring somebody new in, I'd have to get him over because the guy couldn't work, so they go, well, you can work, you work with him. When I got to WCW with Scotty Flamingo, well, you can work, get him over. You know, and then I watch guys like, uh, you know, there. I watch I watch enough guys that were good workers, and um, I didn't want to fall in that category. And I figured I already have enough charisma. But at that point, back then, there were so many stars that uh, the breaking out of the pack was a whole other matter. And I was also young, and I was like, well, I don't want to be a guy stuck in the pack because I'm a good worker, and I just have to put people over because I can make them look better. So I wanted to create something that was personal, which was Raven, but also something, I made the character more barbaric. I didn't make him, because I could have made Raven a, a, a good worker, too. I mean, I could have made him a, a good technical worker, you know, and change holes, and, you know, because you could still be a disaffected slacker and a martyr for society's dysfunction and still be a great athlete, you know, still a great wrestler. I mean, you know, the character could have, let's say, excelled in high school wrestling, but didn't fit in. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily not fit. 
But I made the character more barbaric because A, that's what the business thrives on is, is badasses. B, because that's the kind of character where you're like, you don't say, hey, listen, I need you to get so-and-so over because it's not the kind of work that's going to elevate a guy. You know what I mean? I mean, not that it won't elevate a guy, but it's not the kind of guy... I don't, I don't I got to say this in the proper terminology. It's not that I, it's not that Raven won't elevate you, but if you want a guy to get a technical match to get over the guy who's being groomed or something, that's not where you're going to look cuz Raven's going to, you know, use pots and pans. He's going to be much more barbaric, much more vicious. It's a different style. It's a style. It's not, and it's not that it's a style clash um, or AJ's finisher. It's not that it's a style clash, but it's just it's not where you go when you need that done. And I intentionally created the character to be more barbaric, more vicious, more brooding, more lonerish, because partly that's what, I, that's what I felt inside and partly that's what I felt would be interesting to watch, but also because physically in the ring, I thought there was a better chance of me being becoming a main eventer than being the guy that's always, like, I'll give you the best example, Arn Anderson. Arn Anderson was every bit the worker Flair was, every bit the promo Flair was. But he didn't have that same charisma, that same over the top. Although in many ways, his was a much more um, subtle charisma. And um, which doesn't mean he couldn't have been world champion because he had the potential skills to be world champion. But because he was always the guy used to get the next guy over to face Flair, that's where he was stuck. And um, in fact, me and I had a huge fight about it. Uh, and then uh, eventually he admitted I was right, but uh, we, don't, we still don't get along, so it doesn't really make a difference anyway. Um, and he said it was the way I said it, which may have been entirely possible because uh, I'm not known for my tact. But my point being is that I, didn't want, I, I, I was going to be world champion. Whether I was going to make it there or not is a whole other matter. But I wanted to be world champion. I didn't want to limit my options. And I knew if I stayed as a good worker type character that I was going to be used to get over these bad worker type characters who were going to be groomed for title runs. You know, and, 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 and I could probably assure myself that the highest I could ever get is right below the top. You know, and that would be, you know, and more realistically, a lot lower than that. And I, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to have more than that. And, um... You know, I really respected the fuck out of Arn. I mean, you know, we, we, we can't stand each other personally now, but that doesn't mean that I don't respect the fuck out of him as a worker. He's a hell of a worker and a phenomenal fucking promo man. But he was never going to be higher than that because every booker saw him as, man, what a hell of a worker. Let's use him to get over so-and-so. And so I made sure I created a more barbaric, more vicious character so that I wasn't used in that position, that I was the guy that they were using a guy like him to get over. You know, it worked for in ECW and WCW. I got X amount of far in WWE. I went, and in TNA, I went back up here. So I would say my plan worked pretty fucking well. Um, you know, and it's also, you know, right place, right time. I mean, you know, personality class. There's, there's so many other factors that are involved in this. You know, if I wouldn't have been so um, detrimental to my own career, you know, which is a whole other matter. I mean, there's so many other issues at stake. But what I tried to do was, aside from my personality behind the scenes, I tried to make sure that I covered every fucking base I could and the charisma, star power, work, and all those departments, so that if I was judged strictly by my skills, and not by who and what I am behind the scenes, that I would be, that I would have a shot of being world champion. Um, you know, personal politics always come into play, and it probably wasn't even until a couple months ago that I was actually even willing to take any responsibility for the fact that I may not have achieved what I wanted due to my own, you know, stupidity um, behind the scenes. But that's a whole other matter. But I didn't want to leave anything to chance inside the ring, and so I covered every fucking base. I made sure I could work. I made sure I could do. I could. I could walk and talk. It's known as Shakespeare. I made sure I could be a heel. I made sure I could be a babyface, and I made sure that I was a star. I made sure that when people saw me, they saw a star. They saw star power. I made sure I tried to, or at least I tried to make sure I covered it in every conceivable way so that I would have every opportunity of making it as far as I possibly could and making as money as, I, as much as I possibly could. And ultimately, it never became about money for me. It was, it was more about the art, which is why I walked out on enough places um, because I wasn't happy as an artist. Because I think deep down we're all sensitive artists. I mean, this is, this is an art form, plain and simple. And I probably, I would like to say that I probably said it before anybody did. You know, I was the first person to actually go on record as saying that this is an art. It's an art form. I mean, at least as far as I know I was. And, um, and I believe that. You know, 
I mean, look at the ballet. I dare, I defy the ballet to not rehearse like we do because we don't rehearse. I defy the ballet to just to go to go in the back and call a bunch of high spots, you know, for the Nutcracker Suite. Uh, I'm gonna do a pirouette and you jump on my back and we'll do this and then you spin on your toes and whatever. You know, you couldn't. You know, what we do is a fucking art form. You know, and I think what happens is. Guys forget it's an art form, and they just think it's an athletic, you know, it's just a, fa uh, a semi-fake, or whatever, you know, it's a realistic, but yet out predetermined outcome athletic contest. It's an art form, which means you have to be an artist, which means you're painting a canvas, which means, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I've used this analogy before, um, you know, okay, if you take a piece of art, right, and you take a pretty cool piece of art and you don't put a good frame on it, it's not going to stand out. You're like, well, that's cool. You put a frame on it and all of a sudden, wow, that's something interesting. It, it, it adds to it. I mean, you need the frame. And, uh, oh, good, my food's here. Good, we're finishing up, aren't we? Anyway, so if, you just, if you're just a good worker, a good technical worker, you just throw a bunch of paint on the canvas. You have nothing to hang it on. You have nothing to hang the canvas on. That's why you do everything else, the promos, the ring presence, the attire, the character. That becomes the frame that highlights the picture. And in many cases, the frame's much more valuable than the picture, especially in our business. I mean, I got a, at home, I got a, I got the, uh, I got a Led Zeppelin poster. It's one of those giant, the five foot by three foot ones with the old guy holding the uh, lantern. And it has some of the lyrics um, down in the corner. It's black. And the, the, you know, the lantern guy's like uh, yellowish, greenish or whatever. And um, they probably a $15 poster. I bought like a three, $400 frame for it. I stuck it up there. It's a piece of art now. You know what I mean? I got a uh, I got a Superfly poster, you know, same giant size, probably 10, 15 bucks. I paid another three, four hundred bucks for the frame, and it's a fucking piece of art now. You wouldn't look at it and go, ah, oh, it's just a Superfly poster. So it looks like a fucking piece of art. Many times the frame is much more important than the actual artwork inside. Best example, like I said before, is is the junkyard dog fucking 20 years ago. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of work right in there. But, man, he drew fucking money because he was a larger-than-life superhero character. He was huge. Big star. You know? The work rate is so infinite. You know, technical work rate is so infinitesimally smaller in value than almost all these other things combined. Um... The actual working, which is, uh, it's, uh, unfortunately for a whole other time, the working is what you do between the moves. Anybody can do the moves. You know, there's only so many moves out there, and everybody can do most of them, you know, except for maybe the really acrobatic stuff. It's what you do between them. That's the work, you know. I don't care what the sheets say. I don't care what the Internet says. You know, that technical work is one thing. Appealing to a crowd, appealing to a larger audience, you've got to be a star. You've got to be a character to really draw that the larger audience in because you're appealing to a mass of people you know who, who would you rather watch would you rather see superman or or just some guy or, or just clark kent with a cape no you'd rather see superman would you rather see you know um it's the difference between michael keaton's batman and george clooney's you know george clooney was a farcical batman he wasn't a star he didn't look like batman he didn't carry himself like batman he wasn't believable as batman was Michael Keaton, even though nobody thought he would be, ended up being, or Val Kilmer was. But George Clooney, just, he couldn't buy him in that position, you know? Can, can you mention moves? Can moves give you star power at all? Yeah, ab oh, absolutely. Like a people's elbow or something? Yeah, I mean, moves can give you star power. I mean, they, they can be additional to it. I mean, yeah, that's all part of having your own move set. I mean, you should have four moves, that are at, least, that at least four moves, and probably when you're starting. I see so many guys learning 30, 40, 50 moves, but they've perfected none of them. They do all different moves every single match, so a, the fans can't grasp it. The fans, want, the fans like catchphrases. They like repetition. They like like seeing the same moves. You know, there's a reason why their catchphrases are over because, you know, and and when you're doing a move like the people's elbow, that's like a catchphrase in the ring. It's a physical catchphrase. And there's a reason people do them because people want to see that. They, they like to be reminded of the same things. They like seeing that. They like to identify with it. And all these guys learn all these moves. Don't perfect any of them, or perfect a bunch of them, but don't use them all the time. And so there's nothing for the fan to identify with. You should use force moves. Until you get them over, 
You should perfect four moves. You do them every single match, and you never let anybody reverse them or kick out of them or move them until you get them over. And once that happens, once they're over, like I've got a couple moves that, you know, like when I throw the guy face first in the buckle, he staggers back, I hit the ropes, close on him. If I don't do it for six months, if I shoot the guy and he goes in face first and I hit the ropes, they know what's coming. They've seen it so many fucking times. The drop told on the chair. I could go a year without doing it, but as soon as I put the chair in the center and shoot the guy off, they know what's coming. So once you breed the familiarity to it, then you can use it to, to reverse it, to change it up, to do all that. But nowadays, guys like will get a move, start to try and get a move over. After three weeks, they have the guy reverse it. Well, it's not even established yet. You know, it's like catchphrases, you know, it's, um, you have to establish things. And then, oh, they, there's another thing that goes, well, if I keep using the same moves, it's not going to get boring? Well, no, because I have four moves and you have four moves, so that match is going to look different because my four moves blend with your four. And then my four moves with Rich's four moves are going to blend differently, and my four with his four are going to, so it's always going to come off differently. And besides, four match, four moves in a ten-minute match or a six-minute match, what is that, like 30 seconds, a minute? Yeah. There's so much more in a match to do, but now you're establishing things so that people can bond with you. And that's, that is part of becoming a star, is having moves that people can identify with. You know, and that, 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 that is a very good point. That will help you become a bigger star because now you have a move set that people like can respond to it and they can remember. And that's why catchphrases are so important because people can, you know, it's like I know a catchphrase is over when I hear Disco saying it in the locker room. That's the first key because, you know, if people are doing it at home, then you know the shit's over, you know? People want to identify with something. They want familiarity. I'm exhausted. All right, is there anything in conclusion? We'll see you next time on the next edition of Secrets of the Ring with Raven. Thank you very much.